And my number one interview of 2020 is What a year. <laughs> what a year. And I say that like 1% in the eye rolling, you know, 2020 way of, oh, what a year it's been. But I mostly mean it in the positive, very excited way of, man, what a year this has been. And I get that 2020 has been a tough year and we've all had to make a lot of adjustments and do things in a very different way than we were used to doing them before. But it's also been a year that's allowed us to like take a step back and realize what's important to us and who's important to us. It's also been a year of, of a lot of firsts. And for me, it was my first time ever growing an epic beard. It was my first time ever doing a virtual interview. You know that I love doing interviews in person, being able to look people in the eye and shake their hand and feel their energy. This year we had to pivot and figure out how to do a Zoom interview for the first time. Also the first time I ever wore a mask during an interview. Did you ever think that in 2020, you'd be signed full-time to a wrestling company? No. Uh, surprise, I've lasted this long. First time I ever found out that my neck could make noises like this. Look at your toes just a little bit. Oh! Mm. Dr. Bo Hightower. Man, he has some magical hands there. Also the first time that I was ever grateful that my chest didn't cave in. Oh! Hey! Oh! Mm. Still hurts just watching that video. I get asked all the time, how many days did it take for your chest to heal up? About six days. And when we took that photo for the thumbnail, like look how painful that looks. That was like at the height of when it looked its absolute worst. After that, it just kind of like started bruising and then it got to a point where it looked like I'd spilled spaghetti on my chest, like very like yellow bruising. And then it was fine. But it's mind blowing to me to think that that video has been viewed over 1.4 million times. So I'm guessing if you're watching this right now, you're probably one of those 1.4 million people. So thank you. Thank you for watching me in a lot of pain. So obviously in March, things changed a lot for everyone. And for me, that meant we weren't able to do interviews in person anymore. We had to pivot very quickly, you know, buy a microphone, and just figure out this whole situation to do these interviews virtually, which actually worked out really well because we were able to land a lot of interviews that we probably wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. And the funny thing is when you reach out to someone, like when this thing first started in March and April, if you ask them like, oh, hey, are you free to do an interview? If their answer is anything but yes, they're a liar because like, what else were you doing? Everything was closed. So it actually worked out really well. We were able to get like a ton of interviews and just start cranking them out. So it's been really interesting looking back on this year and seeing all of the interviews that we've done. So to narrow this down to just five is not easy. And I'm guessing there's gonna be an interview that you thought should totally be on this list. And I can guarantee you that that interview was number six for sure. So here we go, my top five interviews of 2020. And I'm gonna give you a little backstory to each one. First of all, to like tell you why that interview was so important to me. And number two, to tell you like how the interview came together because for most of these, actually for most of the interviews I've ever done, there's an interesting backstory of like how the pieces came together to actually make the interview happen. Number five, my interview with Eddie Kingston. With pro wrestling, if you retire <laughs> while your body can still go, he didn't retire, you quit. So we did this interview back in January. It was at the NWA Hard Times pay-per-view in Atlanta. I drove from where I was living in Cincinnati. It was about a seven hour drive from Cincinnati to Atlanta. And I actually didn't know which interviews I was gonna be doing there. I knew that I had access to a handful of people, but nothing was confirmed. So I had just wrapped up an interview with Nick Aldis, which I actually did know I was interviewing Nick Aldis. And then they said, well, are you ready for Eddie Kingston? And I said, I don't know that I'm ready for that interview, but let's do it. And the great thing about Eddie Kingston is you don't really need to prepare. I mean, you stick a mic in that guy's hand, whether it's a promo or an interview, that guy's just gonna go and you're gonna get gold, which is, exactly what we got here. Everyone's like, oh man, because I know people at AEW and like I told you before, I won't, I don't know if I've said this publicly, but like 
when I hit up certain people at AEW who are in control, I don't hit them up like, hey, man, I need a job. I have been hitting them up for years saying, hey, your kids are getting big. Or, hey, man, congratulations on this and that. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I would feel like a real piece of shit or a real fuck boy if I go, hey, man, your kids are getting big. P.S. I really need a job. <laughs> and I want to make some of that Tony Khan money. It's pretty crazy to think that Eddie Kingston almost retired from pro wrestling, almost hung it up completely. And I think we're all glad that he didn't because he is tearing it up right now in AEW. That's it. Like, I'm here. There's no more. Till you die. Yeah. Either, <laughs> either people stop book three ways. Okay. People stop booking me, my body shuts down on me, or like you said, unless I die. Number four is Muhammad Hassan. That was a character that any baby face wanted to go against because it was a heat magnet. I mean, you know, you go out there and it doesn't matter who you are, you're getting cheered because they just want to see me get my ass kicked. I have to give a shout out and a huge thank you to my friend Sean Ross Sapp from Fightful.com because he's the one who made this interview with Mark Copani happen. Mark Copani is Muhammad Hassan's real name. He now works as a high school principal in upstate New York, but he was one of the biggest heels not just of that era, but of all time. And his run was so short, 2004, 2005, like that was it. And then he was released because of that controversial angle and a lot of pressure from the media and pressure from UPN, which is where SmackDown aired. And he got released and basically said, all right, well, I'm gonna retire from wrestling now. And he hung it up completely. It's ironic if you listen to your promos, especially now, 15 years later, it's ironic that people are booing you for speaking the truth. Like nothing you're saying is actually heelish at all. I think he'd be applauded today. If I went out there and said those things today, I, I think I would get a standing ovation because it, it was the truth. I, I mean, it was how people felt in this country. We were reading about it in the news. It was unfair. It was unjust. Arab Americans, Muslim Americans, people were being lumped together as if everybody was a terrorist because they were, you know, from that origin, from that nationality. So it, it was the truth. He's only done a handful of interviews since he was released in 2005. So over the last 15 years, he's done, I don't know, like three or four interviews. So to be able to share this time with him is something that I'm very, very thankful to him for and also very thankful to Sean Ross Sapp for making this happen. I've always been proud of what I did, but I'm at a place now where I have a new level of success in what I'm doing. And I, I don't think that that's the creeping fear or that creeping feeling of failure doesn't affect me anymore. I don't, I don't, and not that, that what happened was my fault. I mean, that was out of my hands. Yeah. But. I have a hard time not holding myself accountable to everything. And so I would still hold myself accountable that there are things that I may have been able to do that could have changed the outcome. Number three is Andrew Yang. You should know, Chris, this is not like, oh, I'm going to talk about this and forget about it. Like this bothers me and I'm not going to rest until something changes. Then I got to say, it's pretty cool to be able to say that I've had a presidential candidate as a guest on my show. And not just any presidential candidate, but a presidential candidate who loves wrestling as evidenced by this conversation here about his favorite match of all time this, this may date me but it like i remember macho man uh steamboat wrestlemania 3 just being this oh. mind-blowing match of the an all-time great yeah uh, and because i was a macho man fan um in part because of that match and then so he loses that match but he somehow gets elevated from it because it was so good and then he goes on to become the champion and uh, I loved the Macho Man title run. It made me very sad when, uh, as a kid, I was pretty young. Uh, but when they gave the title back to Hulk Hogan uh, the following year, I was like, no, I thought we were past this. So Mr. Yang turned a lot of heads when he called out Vince McMahon for the way that he treats his so-called independent contractors. And he's basically saying, look, if you want to treat them like independent contractors, well, let them be independent. Let them do what they want to do. If you're going to treat them like employees, which Mr. Yang says that's exactly what you're doing, well, then give them the benefits of actually being an employee. So I reached out to Mr. Yang on Twitter and I said, I'd love to have you on my show. I'd love to have a conversation with you. He actually wrote me back and said, I'm a big fan of your work. A few days later, we were having this chat. The WWE, to me, has a has a choice. It's, look, we're going to treat you as independent contractors. So you can do whatever you want on your off time. And we don't have uh, all of this say-so over a lot of your activities. Um, or you can start treating them like your employees, which they are. 
uh, and you introduce real benefits, including a real union or professional association and real negotiation. Now, he said in that interview that if Joe Biden was elected president, he would make it his mission to go after Vince McMahon. So when Biden takes office on January 20th, I guess we'll see if anything changes. Will I forget about this? Hell no. And the bill's coming due. Uh, I'm going to be the person that does it or the person that is there when it's done. Number two is Kurt Angle. Oh, it's true. It's damn true. I was really screwed up physically, mentally, psychologically. Um, and I, I had to leave. And when I, when, we, when I did, Vince and I never spoke again until I came back in uh, two years ago. This was actually the first interview that I uploaded in 2020. And I knew the second that interview was done that it would be on this list because it was so, so good. Sitting down with the Hall of Famer and Olympic gold medalist and having him open up for an hour about literally everything was nothing short of incredible. And we were connected through a mutual friend who basically said, all right, yeah, Kurt is down to do this interview. So I texted Kurt Angle, which is crazy to think that I texted Kurt Angle and that's an actual sentence that I'm saying that is true. I texted him and said, well, when are you free? And he said, I'm free after my next WWE loop because of the time he was working as a WWE producer. He said, let's do the interview in Pittsburgh. At the time, unfortunately, I was taking uh, Pecos, I was taking Somas, and you know, every once in a while I would black out, and here I am, Tex events. And uh, so he showed me all these, I'm like, oh my God, I, I actually said this stuff. And he stood up and he took his jacket off. He says, you want to kick my ass? Let's go right now. Wow. And I looked at him. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe Vince McMahon wants to beat my ass. So I had no idea where we were going to do this interview. I was just so excited that Kurt Angle was doing an interview with me. So I booked a hotel room near the Pittsburgh airport, knowing full well that I would only be using this hotel room for one hour for this interview. And I got to the hotel with five minutes to spare because traffic was so bad. They gave me the room key. I sprinted down the hall, got the camera set up and the microphone set up as quickly as I possibly could. When I put the last thing in place, that's when Kurt texted me and said, I'm here. I'm like, this couldn't have timed out any better. And what an amazing conversation with truly one of the absolute best to ever lace them up. What sucks is my, my best phase of my career was in TNA. Mm. I, as good as I was in WWE, yeah. and I was the best there. Yeah. I got better in TNA. And uh, unfortunately, the WWE Universe will never see this match. Well, there's probably a lot of people watching this that have only watched your matches in WWE. So yeah. if someone's watching this and they want to see one of your best TNA matches, right. what should they watch? Uh, anything with AJ Styles, uh, uh, Samoa Joe, Bobby Roode, uh, Desmond Wolf. Uh, Ken Anderson, the Sting, gosh, Stinger. Uh, but there are a lot of a lot of great people. And my number one interview of 2020 is David Benoit. I just, I didn't believe it for days, bro. I think the day it really hit me was his funeral. That was a hard day. That was a super hard day. His story is so amazing, and I am so grateful that he was willing to share it with me. I talked to my dad Father's Day. That was the last time. Wow. We talked for like two hours. Wow. That was the last conversation you had? Yeah. Is there anything specific from that conversation that sticks out for you? Yeah. We were just laughing and getting ready to make plans for the summer, and I got to say I love you one last time to him, and... You know, that was the last time. I'm sorry if this is too much. No, no, no. Okay. It was good to get it off my chest, bro. So up to this point, he had only ever done one interview and it was with Fred Rosser, AKA Darren Young on his podcast called the Pro and Bro Wrestling Podcast. So David and I follow each other on Instagram. And then one day he just randomly sent me a DM and said, I should be on your show sometime. A big fan of your interviews. And I said, absolutely, we will do this thing wherever and whenever. And he obviously lives in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I said, I'm willing to fly to Edmonton. We can do the interview there. He goes, no, I think I'm going to be heading to Vegas in the next few weeks. I want to see a hockey game there. So 
we'll do it when I'm in town. I said, absolutely. I will fly to Vegas. We will make this thing happen. And what are the memories that you have of him? Oh man, we used to travel all the time on the road and he'd tell me stories, and, you know, talk about Eddie and everything, bro. He'd tell me life, mm. tell me what to do and, yeah, you know, yes sir, no sir, all that. And, uh, you know, just laugh. So it took a few months to make this interview happen because the original messages that we sent each other were in October and we finally did this in January. And the biggest thing that you don't see during this interview is that we got to hang out the day before the interview. So we were planning to do the interview on a Friday morning. I booked a flight that landed Thursday night. And as I was landing in Las Vegas, I was like, well, what am I gonna do tonight? I mean, it's Las Vegas, there's tons of things you could do, but I was like, I'm gonna send David a message and say, why don't we go grab a drink or dinner or something? So I sent him a message. I said, do you have any plans tonight? Let's, let's grab a drink. He said, absolutely, bro, let's, let's do it. I think that's one of the biggest reasons why this interview worked because we got to hang out the night before and like feel each other out. We became friends during this process. And then when we did the interview the next day, it was just like two friends just catching up and a camera happened to be there. So when I landed in Las Vegas, I took my suitcase, went straight to the hotel, then I met up with him at his hotel. And of course, in true Las Vegas fashion, we had those giant yard drinks and basically just walked around Las Vegas. And a few hours in, he turned to me and said, I just want you to know that nothing's off limits. And I said, like nothing at all? He goes, yeah, man, nothing at all. I, I trust you and you can ask me whatever you want. And I think in that moment I went, oh my gosh, this conversation is gonna be something so special. And David himself is so special. What's the first thing that most people usually say to you? You look like your dad. Okay, that was obvious. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. There's my top five interviews of 2020. And I'm very curious to hear what your top five are. So drop a comment below and let me know. And if there's a chance that you're watching this and you still somehow aren't subscribed, well, let's change that right now because you don't want to miss out on any of the videos that we have planned for 2021. Now, let me tell you, 2021 is going to be a huge year for all of us. Man, I can't wait. Be great. Be grateful, my friends. We'll see you on the next one.